Hi friends, this is Terry Squires with today's Nashville, This is Faith. I sat down with Rebecca Alonzo and she shared her incredible story, The Devil and Pew Number no. 7. You won't believe the terror that he put this family through. You won't want to miss this episode and how she was able to forgive this man. There will always be haters in our lives, but God's love will overtake them. New York best-selling author Rebecca Alonzo never felt safe as a child. In 1969, her father Robert Nichols moved to Sellerstown, North Carolina to serve as a pastor. There, he found a small community eager to welcome him, with one exception. Glaring at him from pew number seven was a man obsessed with controlling the church. Determined to get rid of anyone who stood in his way, he unleashed a plan of terror that was more devastating and violent than the Nichols family could have ever imagined. This is her story. This is today's Nashville. This is Faith. Rebecca, thank you for sitting down with me this morning. Your story, wow. I read it when it first came out, just reread it, and I'm telling you, it's, it's powerful. And, and I stop and think about everything that you've gone through. Let's talk about it from the very beginning. Thank you. Yes, well, it began with my mom and dad um, being evangelist and being asked to come and speak at a church in North Carolina back in the 60s. And then they were asked to stay on and pastor the church because they did not have a pastor at that time. So I was born the following spring. And uh, so new family, new church, new community, um, new pastorship. And my mom and dad were just happy as they could be. And it started with around 12 people. Uh, in the church, and my mom and dad would just go out and knock on doors and invite people to church on uh, Sunday mornings, and um, everyone welcomed my mom and dad into this little It was like a community. beautiful love story, wasn't beautiful it? Beautiful love story. My mom and dad loved God, they loved people, and this little church had about 12 people in it, and, and then it grew to over 100 people within a year, and it was out in the middle of farming community. So it was big church growth in a short amount of time. And I was, like I said, I was born during that time. Five years later, my brother Daniel was born. And so this church became our church family, but also best friends because our, our family, our blood family was over 700 miles away in Alabama and Louisiana. And we were in North Carolina at this time. So it was just an amazing time uh, growing up as a little girl in a church where everybody, you know, just loved you and a lot of uh, attention, good and bad, because I could never get away with anything as a preacher's kid. But, um, you know, just really felt like that's where God had called my mom and dad. And my dad was ex-military. And so when a soldier is called to a post, they stay there until the, you know, one in charge tells them to leave. And they really felt like God had called them there. So during this time, um, about a year and a half into uh, pastoring, there was a man that came to our church and he sat in pew number seven every Sunday. And he had kind of been running that community, uh, the church, and his name was Mr. Watts. He had a little chat with my dad and said, you know, you're doing things differently than we do around here. You need to go on back to Alabama where you came from. 
And so my dad said, you know what, I feel like God's called us here. And so we're going to set up order. We're going to have an elder board. We're going to run things the way that God tells us to and not the way that you're telling us to. And that just enraged this man, Mr. Watts. He was in his 60s. He was a county commissioner. He was a millionaire. He had a lot of control, a lot of money. My 30-something-year-old you know, dad coming in, um, just trying to set up order and love people and minister to that community. And then he, you know, came in up against this man that did not want to give up his self-appointed position of power. He was like a godfather type uh, figure in that community. Um, so it was just a, a battle began and it began five years of terrorism at the hands of Mr. Watts. It's an incredible story. Let's talk about some of the terror that you experienced? Well, it began with um, threatening letters. And one of them read, because we lived in this little town called Sellerstown, you will leave Sellerstown walking, crawling, dead or alive. So those letters began to come in the mail. And then the harassing phone calls, 30 to 60 a day, a lot of them at night, because, um, you know, they were just trying to wear us down. And, and so we would call the police. And everybody knew who was behind it. Not only did Mr. Watts sit in pew number seven every Sunday in church, but he lived across the street from our house. So he could look out his window, see if we were at home, see if we were out of town. He would hire ex-cons that couldn't get a job, and he would just pay him $20 every time they would call our house and hang up. Or he would pay them to break into our home when we were on vacation. Um, it escalated to drive-by shootings, so they would slash our tires, cut our phone lines, and then drop our house and just riddle our house with bullets. So by the time I was four years old, I had bullets flying past my head. I'm, I'm learning ABCs and how to ride a bike and how to also, when you hear a gunshot, get down. It was, it, was, it was the worst of times and the best of times is the way I try to describe it to people because the church was growing. My mom and dad were doing great, except for this man, Mr. Watts, the only disgruntled person in the community, but the most powerful person in the community. And you had the police couldn't catch him. And I read this one, um, your brother was born. Yes. I might be getting ahead, yeah, no, but somebody came by and started shooting and just, you, they thought your brother had might have not survived it. Right, well that was, it escalated from all the other things to bombings. And that's that's what you're referring oh, yeah. to, okay. was that this man began putting dynamite bombs around our church and around the home. And one of the bombs went off by my parents' window, which is where my baby brother was sleeping. And what happened then? And so my mother just knew. She's like, I can't even go check on him. She's like, I know Danny is, is dead, you know, because that bomb blew out three windows of their room. And she would teach me, she would read Psalms 91 to me at night. And um, it talks about how God will cover you with his feathers. And not one piece of glass or wood was on my brother. So let's talk about all this is going around. I mean, it's just happening nonstop. Was there any time that was just calm? Yes, he would space it out. Mr. Watts would space out the attacks. So three months would go by and we would think, oh, he's, you know, given up or he sees, you know, when the FBI got involved and the ATF agents and they put mobile units in the cornfields behind our house and they would, you know, be out there at night trying to catch these guys, he would lay off and go low and, um, and get kind of quiet. And we would think he had given up, you know, because it was local, state and federal agents involved in trying to catch these guys. And, and they it, couldn't catch them. For huh? two and a half years, the bombings went off. There mm -hmm. were 10 bombings in two and a half years. And not only were we um, terrorized, but that community heard those bombs three miles down the road. You know, they were huge explosions. That's unbelievable. So after the bombings, how did your dad and your mother, how did they handle all this? Because I know I probably would have just said, let's pack up and leave. Right, right. Um, my mom, you know, and dad, obviously, you know, they talked about that. And at first, my dad wanted to stay and my mom wanted to leave. And then it flipped and my mom wanted to stay and my dad wanted to leave because he felt responsible for his wife and his two children. And But, um, you know, we would go stay out at a farm you know, and, and stay at a friend's farm, you know, at night just to be safe sometimes. But they, my mother said, if we leave, he will hunt us down. And then it was Easter. 
The Easter weekend was something that was unbelievable and we're going to talk about it when we come back. Rebecca, Easter, 46 years ago, changed your life. So Easter weekend, I was seven years old. My brother Daniel had just turned three, and my mom's friend had called her and said, um, my husband has abused me again. And they were friends. Like, my mom knew the situation, but they had been reaching out to this alcoholic husband and trying to help him, and he had tied her to a chair and beaten her badly, and so she was just desperate. She ran for her life with her two-year-old, and my mother said, come stay with us, and you know I'll help you. So Mr. Watts, um, the man in pew number seven, found out about this situation and sent some of his guys over to the alcoholic husband and um, just you know enraged him with a bunch of lies, and so he came after his wife who was at our house with her two-year-old. We had just sat down to eat dinner, and this man came barging into our house with three guns and tons of ammunition. And my brother and I watched as a friend of the family shot both of our parents right in front of us at the dinner table. My dad was shot twice and just knocked to the ground immediately. Like, there were guns in our home, but when you're shot in your hip and you can't move, you can't even defend your family. So he hit the ground. My mother was standing next to me at the table and one bullet clipped her heart. She made it down the hallway to their bedroom and got the phone and tried to call for help while the man that did the shooting took his wife and baby hostage in my bedroom for three hours. And I begin the book with I ran because after hiding under the kitchen table and some other things that happened in the house, it went from total chaos and shooting to eerie quiet. And you were only seven. And I was only seven. And my brother Daniel had just turned three, and he actually followed my mom down the hall and then came back um, to where I was and got under the table. My dad was sitting there, and he's bleeding and going in and out of consciousness, and I'm trying to talk to him. I'm trying to keep my brother quiet. And my dad looked at me and said, you're going to have to run for help. So I ran next door to the neighbor's house and got help. And um, you went and checked on your mom. Didn't oh, you? I did. Well, I did. I did. My my dad. Um, went, once we got quiet and I got my brother under the table, my dad said, "You need to go check on your mom." It, it was like a horror movie. You know, that hallway just seemed like it was longer than normal. You know, and everything was quiet. And my bedroom door was right here, and right behind that bedroom door was a man with three guns and his wife and baby. And then my mother's room, my mom and dad's room was on this side. So I had to sneak down the hall. And then I, I saw my mom in their bedroom. And I came back and I told my dad, I said, mom's not answering me. And he just broke and cried. And then he had to pull himself together. And that's when he said, you're going to have to run for help. Because he knew, he, he knew that he was not going to make it bleeding. He was shot twice. He knew he wasn't going to make it if he didn't get help quickly. So I was sent to run for help. And we lived out in the country, so the neighbor wasn't right next door. I had to run down the road to get to the um, our neighbor's house. And then they called the police, and you know, that's when I found out, you know, that my mom didn't make it that day. And my dad survived physically, but emotionally he was just never the same again. And so we had to pack up and leave our home, our church family, my school, and move to Alabama so that we could live with my dad's family, with my grandparents, and one of my dad's sisters, um, my Aunt Dot. And she's the one that took my brother and I in and just loved on us and counseled us and helped us through um, a lot of the dark nights and a lot of the missing and trying to help us process the five years of terrorism and then now the murder of, of my mom and the shooting of my dad. And then the psychological effects on your dad, what happened there? Yes, so he was in and out of hospitals with his nerves and um, was put on tranquilizers, was, you know, just got into the mental health world of trying to help him process the trauma. He had PTSD, and um, I didn't even know what that was as a little girl. And then as I got older, I started looking down the list, and I was like, oh, I had that, I had that, I had that, you know. We just weren't assessed, and then we weren't sent to counseling. So the Holy Spirit really had to counsel my brother and I, and I journaled, and I talked with my aunt, and I went to church. And so we just had a, a strong 
support system with a good Christian family that walked us, you know, through all of the trauma. But my dad was in and out of hospitals for seven years after my mother passed away. And we came home from school one day and we were told that he had passed away from a blood clot going to his heart. And I was 14 and my brother was nine and my world was shattered. It was shattered losing my dad. I was a daddy's girl. So um, I just, I, it was, that was really, really hard to lose both parents. And I got mad at God for two years after that. I was just like, a man took my mother and, um, but God, you took my dad and, you know, I'd rather have him broken than not having. And so I wrestled with the Lord over that for two years. And then I finally realized, oh my goodness, you know, like, <laughs> Thankfully, going to church and still reading my Bible, even though I was mad at God, I was like, I need God more than I need to be mad at Him. I need His love. I need His wisdom. I need His peace. And so the Lord, when I released that anger towards God to Him and just said, I'm tired, you know, I need to give this to you, then His peace came in and healed a lot of places in my heart. Like my, my dad would pray Isaiah 54, 13 over us all the time. Great is the peace of my children for they shall, my, my children shall be taught of the Lord and great shall be their peace. So that was something that he prayed over my brother and I all the time. And when I gave all that anger to God and gave him all my whys, because why this, why that? My dad was a good man. My mom was a wonderful woman of God. Like, why would you let this happen to a pastor's wife, uh, family? Those whys just make you walk in circles. You know, and then when you finally give them to God, He'll give you the what. What am I going to do with this story? How am I going to use it to give Him glory and to take that power away from the enemy with the fear and the doubt and the unbelief? And then so you just give all of that to God, and then He gives you a purpose with that pain. He gives you a purpose beyond that pain to be able to use it um, to help other people. Well, he has given you a lot of strength, a lot of wisdom. Before your dad passed, you had to go to trial, not only once, but twice. And we're going to talk about those trials when we come back. Rebecca, you know, the Lord gives us a lot of trials in our lives, and he's given you a lot on your plate. You literally had two trials. Let's talk about them. So the first trial was the murder trial, and that happened three months after the shooting. So we had moved to Alabama and started over. New school for me, um, my little brother Daniel looking for my mom, calling for her, walking around the house, and me trying to explain to him that mom's in heaven. He goes, well, I want to go there. So how do you explain to a three-year-old you can't just hop on a on a plane and go to heaven, you know? So that was a lot. And then seeing my, my dad struggling with the PTSD and then having to get on a plane with me and fly back to North Carolina for the murder trial. So I had to testify. I had just turned eight years old and had to testify at the murder trial and point to the man that was a friend of our family and say, he is the one that shot my parents. He was sentenced to life in prison plus 15 years. And then my dad and I flew back to Alabama. One of the ATF agents, the FBI agents that was on our case, Charles Mercer, kept my dad up to date on what was going on with the bombing case by Mr. Watts. So the shooter goes to prison for life plus 15. Then Mr. Watts gets taken to trial and was sentenced by a federal grand jury for 15 years. Now, this was the man that was behind five years of terrorism, behind the murder. He was never connected to the murder, completely got away with that. There were a lot of injustices legally, um, so we had to just keep giving it to God because the Bible says, God says, vengeance is mine, you know, because he knows that if we take it into our own hands, we won't have any mercy, and God is merciful. And so, you know, Mr. Watts only got 15 years, and I found out years later he was responsible for a lot of other murders that See, he I, was never connected to. I must, must have missed the part that he had enraged the, the killer, Yes, yes. Well, I, I talk about that in the, in the epilogue of the book um, because Mr. Watts goes to prison and then I get a phone call a few years later from him and I'm thinking, okay, he's been in prison for five years and, um, and now he's calling, you know, he gets a phone call or whatever. So he calls me and he asks 
to speak to me. Now, how old are you now? I am 17. And he uh, says, hello, this is Mr. Watts, you know, with this deep, gruff voice. And he was a big guy and wore, you know, black rim glasses and a fedora hat and just had the look, you know, and all the image was still in my mind. And he said, I have a question to ask you. He said, I, I can't live the rest of my life without knowing if you'll forgive me. And I said, Mr. Watts, we forgave you a long time ago. And he said, well, I'm not in prison anymore. I only served one year because he had so much money and so many political connections. And he was friends with the judge. The judge should have recused himself and didn't. There were so many injustices. How you know? did that make you feel? At that moment, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to forgive him again. Like he, he didn't even serve, 15 years wasn't long enough in one year. But he said, during that one year, our prayers came to pass because we had prayed for Mr. Watts. I grew up as a little girl praying for him, and he said, I found a relationship with Jesus Christ during that one year in prison. And I said, well, I'm so thankful to hear that because that was our prayer for you. And then a few years later, he passed away. And I said, I just can only imagine my mom and dad walking down the streets of gold, and they turn the corner, and there's Mr. Watts. And I just, if he could find God, if he could find forgiveness for what he did with the Lord, him and the Lord, in that one year, in that prison, the money couldn't help him at that time, the political connections, he had to serve that year, um, that he could find the Lord and find forgiveness and then go to heaven. Just it, it's, it's just mind-blowing, the mercy of God. And then um, years later, we end up, I, I meet my husband, Kenny, we get married, we have two children, Colby and Caitlin. We moved to Nashville to do ministry. And then uh, my husband one day just says, I wonder where Harris Williams is, the shooter. And I said, well, you know, he's in, he's in prison for life, honey. Well, he looks him up and finds out, actually, he's out. And I, I'm like, no, he's in prison for life. He took a life, so he's in prison for life plus 15 years. And he said, life back then was 20 he has been out. We were not notified. He's up for parole. He's on parole. He was free living two and a half hours from us when we lived in North Carolina before we moved to Nashville. And so I, I just had to revisit all that, those feelings. And how have you dealt with that? Yeah, it, it was just, I had to make a decision. I had to make a choice because if I didn't, I was going to go down a dark road again. And I had to make a choice again, like, Lord, this is another injustice but he's out, so I pray he makes the best with his second chance that he has. And so what, what's crazy is after that, I, I feel led to write the book, and then our, our book makes it in front of um, a Dr. Phil assistant producer because CNN had done a four-day write-up, and on the fourth day, the Dr. Phil producer saw our, our, our story brought myself, my brother, and Harris Williams, who was out of prison and available, all out to LA to do an interview. And that's when it came out that Mr. Watts had put him up to it, to circle back around to what you said. That is when all of that came out, that Mr. Williams had been provoked by Mr. Watts to come after his wife and come in and, and do the shooting that day. So we got to see Harris Williams face to face. And the last time I had seen him, I was eight years old testifying against him at the murder trial. And we were able to tell him again, Harris, we forgive you. And it was, it was just the most amazing um, closure to that, that chapter in our lives, you know, to be able to see the man that shot our parents, killing our mom and telling that we forgive him. Then the latest update on the story, which is not in the book, um, a couple of years ago, I saw Harris Williams' granddaughter post on Facebook, and she said, he's passing away from cancer. Please keep our family in your prayers. So I messaged her, and I said, please tell your grandfather once again, while he's passing away, that we forgive him and that my mom and dad will meet him at the gate because he had come to Jesus as well. And that was our prayer, was that he would come to the Lord. And I said, I just, I asked Jesus, please let mom and dad meet Harris at the gate and welcome him into heaven because that was their prayer. They loved him. And that was the hardest part was that it was a betrayal from a friend. Um, but God healed all of it. He healed all of it. And I've been traveling and speaking and sharing this story of forgiveness for 14 years now. And it's still tender. It's still 
it, it always will be a tender uh, place. And just looking back at the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God to walk our family through all of that. My brother Daniel's married he, um, to Jennifer. They have two children. And, um, and he's in ministry too, isn't he? He is, he is a mechanical engineer but he has done some ministry and he married Jennifer, whose dad was a pastor. And then Kenny and I have been in ministry for over 30 years and he runs Michael W. Smith's ministry yes. in Rocket Town, Rocket Town. Um, in Nashville called Rocket Town. And it's just been a joy to be able to pour into other people's lives and see God transform their lives through the power of love and forgiveness and outreach. And it's, it's just been amazing. I love how God has kept your heart tender because it could have turned out a completely different way. We only have a few seconds left. I want you to tell us one sweet thing about Aunt Dot. Is mm -hmm. that Aunt Dot, my dad's sister that took us in. She is um, still here and still working and still doing ministry and, and just very, very grateful for her raising us as a single mom while she took care of her parents, while she worked a full-time job, while she did ministry. Uh, she's one of my heroes, so we're very, very grateful to her. And she's my children's grandmother, so because she adopted my brother and I. So it's it's just been a joy to see her be able to be a grandmother to our children. And Colby, my son, is in ministry. He's a missionary, and my daughter Caitlin is in college, and she's the chaplain for her sorority. So our family is just all in with ministry. And I think your mom would just be smiling and just so proud of you. I, I, that's my prayer. That's my prayer. I, I, I took the torch that they passed us, and I've been running as hard as I can with it. Rebecca, thank you so much for sharing your thank story. You, Terry. I know it's going to touch so many people. I pray so. Thank you. My friend, do you need forgiveness in your life? Like Rebecca said, Jesus is there. Take his hand. He's waiting for you. This is today's Nashville. This is faith.